Alright, we're ready. Ready to go. And we're ready. I don't really attach any sentimentality to the car that I drive. It gets me from point A to point B. If it were to break down, if it were to get totaled, I would replace it. I'm not thinking that economically that's viable, that you just replace cars left and right, but I have no real attachment to this vehicle. Although in some sense, I guess maybe I should. I mean, this was the car that I brought my daughter home from the hospital for the first time. It's the car that she's grown up with. As I've changed car seats, as she's grown, as we dropped her off for daycare in the first time, it was all in this car. But it's still just an object to me. It's not really anything more than just a car. There are millions of cars on the road in the United States at any given time. It's kind of weird that I thought about that in terms of the United States. I mean, there's a whole world full of cars out there, a whole world full of drivers. Everyone's got somewhere to go. Thousands of different cities, hundreds of different destinations, dozens of different motivations. And I'm driving my car. How long will the car last? How long will my mind last? Is anyone else in the world thinking this exact same thought at the same time? Does anyone really care to think about things like this? And how come when we get out of the car, none of these thoughts, none of these daydreams seem to last? It's almost like we go into a state of sleep when we're driving alone. Some of us listen to podcasts, books, stories, music. Sometimes I think about songs that I want to write. But then when I get to the destination, that little bit of autopilot seems to turn off. And then I'm back, walking, eating, working, cycling. But completing the same cycle that we do every day, that cycle that speeds time up in our perception and that turns days into weeks before we notice that that has even changed. But yet, for the time that we take extended drives, our mind explores, it wanders. Our eyes are stuck on a fixed road, but our brains are expanding in many different directions at once. You look at the lines, but you don't think about the lines on the road. You see other cars, but you don't think about the people inside. You see signals, but you don't think about what they mean. But every time you stop or slow down, you alternate a series of unforeseeable consequences that are forever changed. Arrive somewhere too early, and interrupt a moment that could have been really important to someone else. Arrive late and lose the sense of energy that would have been there at the time you were supposed to arrive. Either way, you end up driving back. So what are the value of these thoughts? If most of the time we end up not acting upon them, why does it matter? Today I'm thinking about the class that I just taught. I gave them the chance to open up and write persuasive speeches about anything that they were passionate about. I told them to brainstorm a list of three to five possible topics, narrow down to the one they cared about the most, let them know it could be about any range of topics that interest them, as long as they felt it was important to write a persuasive speech that would somehow benefit their classmates, something of their own choosing. This is one of those rare times where I said, all right, there are no limits, there are no categorical denials that I'll be placing on you as your teacher. You just pick something important. It's the last day of the quarter. We're a day ahead. Let's have this little thinking experiment. Now I combine that with the style of Oxford debate where you pull the class before and after to see who agrees, disagrees, and is unsure about your claim as a speaker. And then you make your speech and you see if after that speech, when you pull the audience again, did you move the marker? Did you change anyone's mind? And I asked each of them, to grab three academic sources, and I helped them select sources that are verifiable or that had some aspect of trustworthiness to them. Now, why do you sometimes, when you have an assignment like that on a day where you had extra time, why are, are the lessons from those days more meaningful than the days that you spent hours planning? Is it because the students generate their interest and their own inquiry? Is it because ideas and the sharing of ideas is such a deeply human trait that 
the importance of that kind of a moment supersedes the importance of lessons that we plan with learning objectives and success criteria. Whatever it was, that class was magic today. I wish every day was like that. I wish every day had that sense of clarity. Why is it that sometimes we're in the car and we're thinking about things that matter? And other times we're singing along mindlessly and we don't make any conclusions that make us better as people. Why is it that we don't spend every day bettering ourselves? Is that the thing that separates us from the extremely wealthy or the extremely powerful or the perceived successful people of the world? Is it diet? Is it physiology? Is it brain chemistry? Is it all of these things? And why is it today that while I'm driving in my car, I'm pondering these things where normally such deep questions would be left for moments so rare that we never follow up or act on them? Why is it we rely on professionals and trained psychologists when we could all explore our own mind once in a while and possibly come to conclusions that better us as people? So on this day, I'm reflecting on what my students said in the classroom on a variety of deeply serious topics and concepts that will shape their own worlds where all I did was give constructive feedback about how to format their speech, but I let their words ring out as the mission and the learning target of the day. And maybe these days are just equally as important in doing so. Because what you get when you have a variety of students speaking on a variety of issues from their heart, backed up by data or science or tech or experts, but really driven by their own minds and their own hearts, you really develop the aptitude of listening. Listening and processing without judging and even allowing your mind to judge before and say you agree or disagree and not sure, but keeping your ears open enough for the possibility that an idea or some ethos, logos, or pathos might change your mind. And to me, in that moment, that felt like life. Or maybe it's the errand that I'm running today, which is atypical, that I'm driving an hour after school to go somewhere I don't normally go and do something that I don't normally do. Maybe it's breaking those neural pathways, the expectations, the normalcy. Maybe that's what leads to new ideas or considering things or more clarity. Or maybe it's that being in a classroom where that clarity was open and flowing that leave those bonds open for potential and those roads of thought worthy of traveling. Why are we always rushing? Is there something so great and magnificent coming two tasks from now that we need to hurry through the moments of our lives that we can only live once? You've heard people before that every moment is precious, but I don't think we get to realize that until much, much later. Even though people tell us their advice, we dismiss it because it wasn't seen through our own eyes and wasn't heard through our own ears. And what if our minds are trying to tell us things all the time? but we're tuning it out or plugging in other sources or substituting it with more comforting activities. Why do we only raise these questions sometimes? It seems like to really gain ground, we'd have to think about these things more often. We'd have to reflect. We'd have to be honest. We'd have to look in the mirror and we'd have to think in the mirror. Who is it that we're trying to become? And I think one of the things that struck me today about that class is that I really felt like I was asking them to consider ideas that might make them better people or drive them to become more successful or to consider what it would look like to be successful in their minds. And whenever, as an adult, that you're giving that advice, you can't help but listen to your own words and think, what am I really doing? How am I changing the world? Do I want to change the world? And if so, how? And what am I really willing to do in order to do that? But where is the impact on a greater level? Does everyone get to have that impact? Was it looks or skill? Was it content or was it promotion? Is it us as consumers that decide or are tastemakers forcing the issue? But when I taught about the enlightenment and thinkers that changed the world in the 17th and 18th centuries, their ideas were about progress and science, pushing boundaries and politics and what should be right for the people. And now it feels like we follow the popular based on possibly less important qualities or more superficial qualities. And is this 
Another example of changing the subject to scapegoat someone else and turn the focus off of who we want to be. Because it sure seems like we are really good at changing the subject and thinking about something else. I guess I've always considered impact to be important. So what are we telling the people around us? Teacher or not, the people that you see, the people that you meet. What's your impact? This is your one. 